This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. In this episode, Coombe goes to Cardiff in Wales to talk with David Roach, an artist who's done work for 2000 AD, Dark Horse, and DC, and is currently working on Doctor Who magazine, published in the UK by Panini Magazines. He's also a comics archivist and historian, and has written several books about Warren comics artists of the 70s, and one about great British comics creators. Coom asks him about what inspired him to be an artist and how he broke into comics, and whether living the dream has lived up to the hype. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. All right, so I'm in Cardiff. This is Coombe for Deconstructing Comics. I'm in Cardiff with David Roach, and this is an absolute pleasure because this is one of my favorite people, and we've just been in a studio looking at the vast piles of inspirational things that he's collected and his artwork and some of the show that he's putting on in Poland. So I am absolutely delighted. He's got sinusitis, so I'm not sure how this interview is going to go, but we shall see. I'm going to try and sound as normal as possible. Okay. Um, I usually start off asking people about how they got into comics. Uh, You said you were born and raised in Cardiff. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know that you were a fan very early on because I've seen that letter in a very early issue of Cerebus that you sent in, Cerebus the Aardvark. And I know that when you were a member of Hellfire, you did that very, very early interview with Alan Moore, maybe the first or one. It was his second ever. Mm. And the only reason I know that is because it's in the book, I think it's called The Collected Conversations. Conversations, And it was chronologically, they put it second. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that they've mm-hmm. done their research, and yeah, yeah, it was um, that was conducted here at a convention in Cardiff, in Cardiff called the Cymru Con, mm. and he had just been writing for Warrior for about a year, but we were fans enough to realise that he was a superb writer and wanted to have him. Um, but yeah, I mean, my interest in comics goes way back before that. Um, you know, we were talking earlier on about growing up in Britain, having mm. annuals. Mm-hmm. So that was always part of my my upbringing. So I would have had Rupert annuals probably when I was six or seven, mm-hmm. I suppose. And I certainly had a Dan Dare annual when I was nine. But uh, it took me a little while to really discover what I liked. Because I remember my my parents bought me uh, the Beano Mm -hmm. when I was very young. Uh, And I didn't like it at all. Didn't mean anything to me. Then I had a comic called The Wizard, which had a story about giant spiders in, which terrified me so much that I begged them to cancel The Wizard, so I didn't have that anymore. But then I went up to my local shops and they had a comic called TV Action. Uh, And I was attracted because I think there was an offer for free free packet of sweets on the back. So I possibly bought it for that. But it had the most amazing artwork inside. It had Doctor Who by Jerry Haylock, UFO by John M. Burns, and The Persuaders by Jose Ortiz. Were they credited? Did you know who Uh, Well, they were were credited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. That's the unusual thing about TV action was that it actually did have credits for the artists, if not the writers. Uh, I was blown away. 
absolutely blown away. How old were you at this time? I was, uh, I think I'd just turned eight. Mm. I think I was seven or eight, something like that. And, you know, I loved Doctor Who on television. I loved UFO. Uh, never seen The Persuaders, but that didn't matter. Uh, and it had, uh, you know, other great strips in it. But those were the those are the three artists that really grabbed me. I thought they were stunning. And if you look at it now, it still looks amazing mm. today. It's just fabulous artwork. Well, how did you go from loving comics as an adolescent or a teenager into deciding this was going to be your profession? Uh I can't imagine ever doing anything else other than drawing. So you knew from like when you were 13 that this is what... Oh, absolutely. Oh, much earlier than that. Uh, interesting thing was around the same time I was buying TV action, I was also discovering American comics, which were certainly around here, harder to find, uh, but my local news agent did have a few. Um, so I bought Conan and Ghost Rider and a few things like that, which my parents then threw out because they were terrible comics in their eyes. But then a year later, I tried again. And that was OK. I could keep them. So this would have been things like Captain Marvel, Captain America, just mainstream comics. Uh, and I just absolutely fell in love with them and wanted to find out more. Who were these artists? What were these other comics that were advertised in, in, in the things I was buying? And I would just go to secondhand shops, um, fairs. I, bit by bit, I began to go to special specialty shops like Dark They Were a Gold Night in London and Forever People in Bristol. Just the names alone give an idea of the sort of exoticism of American comics to someone growing up in Britain. In the you know, in the seventies, most British comics until two thousand AD came along were quite sort of gritty and grim, uh, black and white. It didn't totally attract me though I, I loved the war comics, but uh, TV action only lasted a year after I started buying it. So I was bereft, you know, and looking around for other things. Uh, it, it's strange. The artwork in British comics was things like TV action or uh, the Trigan Empire, which was in Look and Learn. It was intimidating because... People like John M. Burns, Jerry Haylock and Don Lawrence that did Tregan Empire. They, they were so good, you couldn't imagine doing it yourself. You know, Tregan Empire was painted. Very intimidating. But then if you look at uh, American comics, it seemed somehow more doable, more approachable. So I always had it in my mind from that moment on, I suppose, that I was going to be a comic book artist. Did you go to art school with a view of going into comics? Yeah. Because yeah. some people go to art school and then they sort of find a love of comics later on, something that they put down and then picked up. By the time I was 18, going to art college, I'd all, I already had thousands of comics. I'd already been writing for fanzines. I published my own fanzine, Hellfire. Um, Did you do that with a group of people, or were you? Well, the... it was my brother and I. Oh, so I, it was. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, it was mostly me. I gave my brother all the hard stuff to do, like mm. typing it up mm. and uh, pasting it up, and so on. Uh, yeah, it was you know, my idea. But I'd been contributing to British fanzines for a couple of years before that. I was just a hardcore fan. Yeah. You know, as hardcore as you can imagine. And it must have been. Difficult, given the fact that I'm sure that in Cardiff at the time, I don't know about now, but I'm sure there wasn't like a whole community that you could just plug into. You must have just been appreciating this stuff. I did have friends at school who were into comics. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a comic shop in the centre of town which opened up in the late 70s. It was whenever Dollar Comics first came in, DC Dollar Comics. I remember walking up the street 
and seeing a load of comics in the window of this place with these dollar comics which weren't distributed over here. So that sort of attracted me into mm-hmm. there. And I began to make friends uh, amongst the people that would hang out there because we'd go in on a Saturday morning and just spend hours hanging around in the shop talking to each other. Uh, I, I knew fans around the country mm. by that point as well. Mm. Uh, and I got to know a few comic artists over the years. I went to my first convention in the late 70s where Jim Steranko was the guest of honour. So that was uh, quite something. I mean, it, 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 there wasn't a mystery about it to me. It seemed doable somehow. That's amazing because I wouldn't say I felt that way. Oh. I take it that your parents didn't object to you picking this career path. I never asked them. I, <laughs> and they just accepted that you were gonzo, crazy, and I suppose so. Religious. I suppose so. Well, maybe my art, the art that I was doing, might have looked vaguely professional. So they probably didn't look at it and think this is insane. Mm. You're never going to make a living mm. doing it. Uh, and I say I did go to art college, and I had I did um, fine art and philosophy. Did you ever have any doubts as an artist? Did you ever say, oh, I don't know if I can, you know, muster the capability to do this or I'll never be as good as my idols or anything like that? Um, Well, I was reasonably confident in my own abilities. Looking back on it now, it was, my early stuff was absolutely terrible, really. Um, And... uh, I was maybe overconfident in my ignorance of what it took to be a comic book artist. But that's what you need at the time, isn't it? You need to have an enormous amount of self-confidence. Um, you need to be self-deluded to a degree, I suppose. Um, but I came into 2000 AD at just the right time. Was that really your first work at yeah, college? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what year are we talking about, roughly? Uh, it was 1985 that I was in my last year of, oh, no, yeah, 85, I think it was. Mm. I met Steve McManus, the editor of 2000 AD, Mm -hmm. at a UCAC convention, showed him my stuff. And he said, when you graduate from art college, do us a sample page. And if it's any good, you can work for us. Did you get that letter where it's got the robot at the bottom that says you've been accepted or whatever? No, I never got anything like that. No, I wish I had. That would have been great. I think writers got that Ah, if they submitted a script or something. But yeah, 1986, I graduated. I got my degree, which has been... Well, that's why I never saw your stuff, because... It was in 1986 that our family left the UK. But anyway, go on. You, yeah, he moved just the right time to avoid me. <laughs> well, we um, reconnected at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. I did a page of Judge Dredd, and I did a page of a sort of uh, female character blowing up a car. <laughs> and it was, the drawing was very rudimentary. But the inking was pretty slick. Uh I, I know I, I know so much about comics, and I've seen so many other artists that I sort of knew how to do it in a theoretical sense, rather than necessarily having the drawing ability at that point to I be see. able to carry it off. But uh, 1986, by that point, almost all the first generation of 2000 AD artists had been swiped by DC Comics. So if I'd gone in a couple of years earlier, I would have been competing with Dave Gibbons, Brian Bolland, Kevin O'Neill, all these people, but they'd all gone. So they were, 2000 AD were looking for artists and I was part of a new generation that, that came in at around that time. I mean, I came in at the same, within a couple of weeks of uh, Simon Bisley Mm. Uh, I was drawing Nemesis, he was drawing ABC Warriors, 
Glenn Fabry had started maybe two years earlier. Mike Collins came in around the same time as me. And then soon after me, we had Chris Weston and Liam Sharp. Whole group of us. Um, then after a year of doing Nemesis, uh, Barry Kitson was uh, pinched to draw Legion of Superheroes, which would have been Legion 87, I suppose, at that point. And they needed someone to draw Judge Anderson. And I was known as somebody that could draw mm-hmm. female characters, mm-hmm. which not many 2000 AD artists were particularly interested in. It was very much about male heroes, very sort of gritty. Carlos Escara, Mick McMahon were the main mm-hmm. style, mm-hmm. stylistic influences for most people Mm -hmm. and it was you know big and gritty and And a little bit satirical oh yeah yeah very much so whereas your art style isn't satirical at all it's very naturalistic and realistic almost veering towards photorealism at times i suppose that's there that's there i mean my natural style is to draw very very realistically and you can see it in the drawings i'm doing now we were looking at them just earlier Mm -hmm. on i mean Mm -hmm. my natural style as, as, as much as I'm totally based in comics and totally immersed in them, uh, to the degree that, you know, you can barely walk to my drawing board because of boxes and piles of these things. But my natural drawing style is not comic-y. Uh, I'm someone that draws and I'm someone that likes comics. So I draw comics. Uh, In another life, you might have been more of a, I don't know, a figure painter or something like yeah, that. Yeah, maybe. Think, maybe if yeah. I'd been drawn, if I'd been um, born several decades earlier, mm-hmm. or someone teaching anatomy in an art college or something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe. I mean, that, that comes totally naturally to me. It's uh, the hard thing is thinking of dramatic poses and... That sort of thing. I mean, I drew Batman for a year. How did you end up working for DC? And I wanted to also ask you, how did you like your experience at 2080? Did you gravitate towards 2080 because you thought you'd be a good fit or because they were the big game in town? Uh, I loved 2080. I mean, I bought issue one when it came out. Mm. It had so many astonishing artists in it. Mm. Uh, I mean, not just the the Brits, but Spanish artists like Carlos Escara, uh, Jesus Redondo was a big, big favourite of mine. I loved his stuff. Uh, By the time I was getting into comics, there were fewer options in this country. And, you know, there was Marvel UK. I did a few things for them, but just inking a couple of small jobs. It tended to be either a two-thirds of D artist or a Marvel UK artist, or British Marvel, as we called it then. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I always wanted to draw for 2000 AD. Did you like your experience there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, it, it meant a lot to me then, and it still means a lot to me now to be in the comic, because it's such a prestigious title, and I was being surrounded by so many great artists that I loved. So... Yeah, I, I really appreciated it, but I was very slow. Yeah, I, I got that feeling that you worked at a slower pace and also you were a bit of a speciality artist, that they wouldn't use you like a workhorse. Uh, no, I was I was a workhorse artist, but I was so slow that it just came out irregularly. But I worked 2000 for five years, solidly, and I drew every day. So, no, I would have been in the issue, in the comics a lot more mm. if I'd been fast enough. I just wasn't fast enough. Well, did they complain or did that lead to any friction in terms of you getting continuous work? Or? I had continuous work. That wasn't a problem. They were very, very good there. And I, I worked really closely with Alan Grant, who was the writer of Judge Anderson. Sure. Uh, brilliant writer. Always loved his stuff. His scripts were just perfect. Mm. Still the best I've ever worked with because he would pace stories so wonderfully. He gave me interesting things to draw. Oh, 
And it's always a joy to work with him. Uh, the editors were less enamoured of me just because I was slow, so I made life difficult for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I still get on extremely well with Alan McKenzie today, though, who was the deputy editor for most of the time that I was working there. And Steve McManus I get on with, with great still. Uh, no, I mean, I think that it would have been... I just made life difficult for them because I was so slow. And they're used to having artists like Carlos or Dave Gibbons who could do, you know, a page a day. Right. And brilliant pages as well. Right. I'm lucky they were so indulgent. So you were going to talk about how you ended up working for DC and... Uh, well, at Dark Horse was first... And oh, I, did you do the Jedi stuff for Dark Horse before the Batman stuff? Yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that I was see. the chronology of it. I see. And you did some alien stuff in yeah, there somewhere. Yeah, I did aliens. Um, I met Mike Richardson at UCAG. In the 80s, you would get DC, Dark Horse, Marvel. Well, Marvel less so, but certainly DC and Dark Horse. They'd come over every year and they'd be actively looking for artists. It was, you know, British artists were cool. They had Brian Bolland, and they thought, wow, there must be more Brian Bollands out there. So I was talking to Mike Richardson, and they first wanted me to draw Robocop, but I didn't fancy that at all. Then they came back to me with Aliens, and that seemed fun, so I drew a few issues of that. Not very well. Mm -hmm. um, then I did Tales of the Jedi, which I enjoyed. I was pitifully slow again. That was with uh, Tom Veach, who's a great writer. Then his brother Rick Veach, I think, is really interesting too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've never worked with Rick, but Tom is great, a great chap, really, really great to work with. I think Batman after that came just because Alan Grant was writing it mm -hmm. regularly, and I think he, I was wondering if that was the connection. yeah, that was totally the connection, and they pitched them with an idea of us doing a. Uh, square bound mm -hmm. comic which was Batman Demon mm -hmm. which, did, did you end up doing that? yeah yeah I drew it Yeah, I think that must have been after I stopped collecting because I think one of the last Alan Grant things I got was the Judge Dredd Batman thing with Bisley which was kind of a flop it was uh, I think this came out around the same time I'm not totally sure well that would have been about 91 wouldn't yeah you know, that's when I drew it 91 mm -hmm. yeah but it was for some reason it seems hard to find yeah I don't know that I've ever seen it no myself. no I assume that it's sold out and it's never been reprinted since but mm -hmm. it is a difficult one to find it's been in, you can get it in Spanish it's, I think it's more easy to get in Spanish than it is in English. Well, did you do a very kind of realistic style on that, or did you kind of adapt to a more American comic booky kind of thing? Well, you saw a couple of pages just now. It was mostly set in hell. So oh, yeah, I, that's right. I did see I them. Yeah, did it in a, I suppose, what you'd call a 2000 AD style. It had a gritty I, kind of thing. Yeah, gritty... Lots of blacks in it. Um, it was sort of a fantasy feel, mm -hmm. I suppose. Didn't you also work with, um, uh, you know, that long-running Batman artist? Uh, what's his name? Jim Aparo. Thank you, Jim Aparo. Yeah, I did. With, on a Bane story or something? Uh, no, it wasn't Bane. It was uh, No Man's Land, where there was a big... Uh, it started off with a big earthquake, and then... I'm not totally sure what happens in No Man's Land. I've not read all of it. But uh, <laughs> I uh, was very slow doing Batman Demon. It just took forever. It was a very demanding strip, vast numbers of crowd scenes and mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. So I think at some point I might have mentioned to my editor, Scott Peterson, that I'd like to do inking because I am really fast inking other people. Uh, so I inked Batman across numerous different titles for a couple of years. So I started off inking Graham Nolan, then I moved on to Jim Aparo. I also inked Mike Diodato, a um, few other people. Um, I did, uh, then I did a 
Star Trek series. I inked some Star Treks as well and did stuff for the licensing department, role-playing games. I mean, it was just all sorts of weird stuff for easily five years, pretty much exclusively for DC, mixing it up with illustrations of Dungeons and Dragons for Wizards of the Coast. And that was the 90s for me. It was basically DC and Wizards of the Coast. I don't think I did anything in British comics for that mm -hmm. decade. Mm -hmm. And so what's your mix of work now? You obviously did that recent Judge Anderson story, so you're still tied to 2080. Yeah. Are you still doing any work for the Americans, or are you mostly doing commissions? You seem to be doing a lot of commissions. Uh, it's Most of my day is taken up with Doctor Who. Mm. So I came back to... And Brit Doctor Who is published by... Panini. Panini, that's right. Yeah. So I came back, somehow there was a connection with Panini. I can't remember the chronology of it exactly, but my friend Stas Johnson was going to be doing something for them, which didn't pan out, but I ended up speaking to the editor and they were looking for an inker for the, the strip. So I inked a few episodes, then I inked some more, and then some more, and then 19 years later, I'm still... Working mm. for them. Are you a Doctor Who fan yourself? Yeah, yeah. Like I, way back from childhood, or is it more like a, you know, it's cool now and it's. Oh, I liked it when it wasn't cool at all. Mm -hmm. No, I was a, a big fan. Well, it was in the TV action. It goes right back mm. to the first comic that really got me interested in the medium in, in the first place. Um, I it, couldn't stand it as a kid personally. But this was like the early 80s and there was really nothing much happening in terms of movement of camera or anything. It was just all the same set. and The uh, the budget just wasn't there. No, it what wasn't. What can you say? I mean, no. It really wasn't. Uh, when I've seen clips of the old stuff from the 60s, that looks like a bit more fun, like when you go to the Wild West or something. But the stuff in the 80s just... just I well, know. I was a fan of John Pertwee. So it's the 73, 74 yeah, that's before period. My time. Yeah, I mean, I just love them. And in context of what was around at the time elsewhere, mm -hmm. the, the sort of the production values looked okay. Sure. Once you've seen Star Wars, you can't then go back. Or even, to... or even the Star Trek episodes from yeah. the 60s. Yeah, They're yeah. just so much more, yeah. I think the sort of the when Doctor Who was on, I think it was filmed on video or something. I mean, mm -hmm. it just looks cheap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can you say? Well, but, any, anyway, you were a fan, and so you were happy to. Yeah, draw. you know, it was interesting. More important than really the subject matter in this sense is the people you work with, mm -hmm. and. I, I was lucky enough to work with some great people at DC Comics, um, Scott Peterson and Joe Illidge, who was my editor on Batman for a while. I think Danny O'Neill was the overall editor, but I never really spoke to him. They had what they called the Bat Office, and Denny would be in charge of the books in general, but then you would have individual editors who you'd actually interact with. And uh, Scott Peterson and Joe Illidge, I worked with really happily for a, a couple of years, but then they moved on. Mm. And so you haven't done any work for DC in a while? No, all the people I knew there, like those and Paul Kupperberg and so on, I mean, they've, uh, they're have they not there anymore. Fair enough. There seems to be a very high turnover. I think DC especially, uh, maybe Marvel as well now, but, uh, well, both those companies have really just become... <laughs> license holders for big properties that they want to market, 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 and then rejig so that they can get a new little mini generation hooked and so on and so on. Yeah, I mean, that that could well be it. it it's, you know, great fun to work on those characters, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but on Doctor Who, I'm working with uh, Scott Gray, and he's extremely demanding. He keeps us artists in our place. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's what you need to have, a, you know, a decent looking strip. Sure. Coming up, has living the dream lived up to the hype? David discusses his books about comics. 
the artist that Kuhn was surprised that David likes, his exhibition in Poland, and more. If you're enjoying this podcast, help us keep going by visiting patreon.com slash deconcomics and making a monthly pledge. If you pledge at least $3 a month, you'll have access to the letters to Stan Lee that I photographed at the American Heritage Center in Laramie, Wyoming this past summer. I'm currently publishing a new one on Patreon every day. Also, if you give at at least the $3 level, once a month on the podcast, we'll give a plug to your comic or whatever else you might want to promote. We really appreciate your support. This is an imaginary podcast, which may never have happened. The Short Box Showcase. But then again may have. About a father and daughter. I'm Professor Allen. And I'm Emily. Who came from Ohio and talked about comics. Walking Dead. Tintin. Black Lightning. White Tiger. It tells of their rise to glory, when the great guests were yet to be booked. Let's put it this way, Shogun Warriors wasn't going to win any Eisners. And the great feats of editing, not yet performed. And this is Ultra 7, this is Ultraman Jack, and this is Ultraman Taro, and this is Ultraman Leo, and this is Ultra- Of how they spoke at length. This continuity is really the brainchild of nitpicking nerds the world over. But to be fair, the best kind of confession is the Force Confession. And reviewed in brief tales that explore creatively the bounds of a given character's history. Red Sun is wonderful with a very strange ending. Of brilliant creators before their fall from grace. This is the era where Miller is at the height of his creative and artistic powers. And the ability of strong writing to encapsulate and transcend its time. Flash of Two Earths by Gardner Fox. This is an imaginary podcast. Aren't they all? Short Box Showcase is part of the Relatively Geeky family of podcasts. Check us out on the web at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search in iTunes for Relatively Geeky or Short Box Showcase. And remember... We're not experts. We're just family. In terms of going back to your being a child and a big fan, has being a veteran in the comics industry panned out in terms of rewarding that early fandom and that what is this what you envisioned or has it has it not fulfilled those? My interest as an artist was never really drawing particular strips. It was always the ability to actually create work that's of a standard Mm. that I'm pleased with. So do do, do you switch over to another part of your brain then when you work that's not the fan part? Yeah, there's two different things. There's the fan that collects. And, you know, I love people like Russ Heath, for instance, and I just want everything that Russ Heath's ever drawn. Mm. So that's... That's one son, or Garcia Lopez we were talking about earlier on, that I'm totally obsessive about. Then when it comes to drawing, I've got my own approach, my own standards, and I'm just always trying to create something that I'm proud of. Uh, I always try my best, and I'm sort of generally pleased with what I do while I'm doing it. I look back the next day, and I'll think, you fool! Why couldn't you see the millions of things that are wrong with this page? It's as you live in a state of perpetual dissatisfaction with your work. And I think a lot of artists are like this. A lot of the the people that I know in the industry tend to feel that way. As a writer, I feel that way. I think that's very common. Mm, mm. I look back at writing and I just go, there are a hundred things I could fix yeah. on this page. Yeah, and yeah. why couldn't you spot it the first time round? Because you were in the frenzy of creating it and it was just pushing you along and you were... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think in the last couple of years, I've begun to create work that I think I can just about present to people. I'm just more or less happy with it. Things that I do that all the covers for the Doctor Who graphic mm-hmm. novels and I'm mostly pleased with those I think they come out quite well uh, but it's my life drawings they're the, the things that I can point to as examples of my natural style mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when I did Judge Anderson for the uh, 2000 AD anniversary issue I had pencil panels which I threw into the story 
which were more or less my finished life drawing style. And it was a way of showing what I can do. So that was something that I was really, really proud of. It's just amazing that it's such a recent thing. But I, I also want to ask you about the other side of your career, which are the books that you write mm. and the scholarship that you do, because I think that really comes out of your obsessive collecting. And in an audio interview, there's no way to give a sense of the piles of artwork you've collected by the people you admire and the the, the artifacts, the piles of books and comics and various things that attest to your vast knowledge and interests. So if you could talk about, I don't know, I guess the best thing to do would be, I, I know, I, I got the feeling that uh, David puts out a, a Facebook feed that's kind of not just a Facebook wall, but it's sort of like a daily document of just stuff that he loves and admires and wants to alert friends to. And I, I believe nobody else can join because he's got the maximum limit of friends on Facebook. But when I'm you can you, follow, you can follow, but my you Facebook can't. page is totally is open. Oh, so anybody good. that follows can still comment and like and so on. I always have it completely open so as many Wonderful. people can see it as possible. Yeah. And I highly recommend that people join. I've, I've always recommended that people follow your stuff if they can. Um, so, I got the sense that when I joined about three years ago that you were mostly exclusively interested in the Warren stuff, especially Vampirella, those artists and, and that kind of style, that kind of very 70s naturalistic, realistic style that people like Neil Adams and so on bleed into. But you have so many interests. And lately we've been talking a lot about Garcia Lopez. So I thought I'd just... And you've also released a recent book about um, Jose Gonzalez. Yeah. So I just thought I'd get you to talk about whom you like writing about and whom you like. I mean, we when we were in my studio, we, I I pulled open a drawer and we were just I was just showing you all the Our Army at Wars I had, for instance, because I love Russ Heath and Joe Cuba mm -hmm. and Alex Toth and all these people. And I've got vast amounts, you know, like decades worth. And it, with me, it's always been the case that if I see something I like, I want to know everything about it. It's, it's when, when I first discovered um, Warren comics, uh, I was absolutely blown away by it. You know, um, Vamp I started buying Vampirella every month and I adored Jose Gonzalez. I was frustrated, actually, that there was... There's so little information about them. Uh, it, it wasn't just that you didn't know who was in each issue, but it was who were all these Spanish artists. And uh, so I collected them over the decades and eventually had every issue. And then I began to make these connections between work that these artists had done in Britain, because they all worked in Britain in the 50s and 60s before going on to work for Warren. In mm -hmm. fact, some of them barely worked in Spain at all. Mm -hmm. they, they, was very, they were very... headhunted by... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's, yeah. There, there's a whole story there. But, um, I mean, I suppose it is obsessive to the, to the extent that, um, you know, I have been collecting these things in uh, enormous numbers. But it's... I'm never satisfied with what I what I know I always want to know more mm -hmm. I always want to see more great artwork what is there out there uh, and I always want to know the whole story so um, I suppose I've got enough of an ego to assume that other people might be interested as well which has led to all these different books about comics the latest one uh, Masters of Spanish Comic Book Art I think is my favourite because what I've done is bring together a whole country's output, but looked at it on a global scale. So it's not just, oh, they drew for Warren comics. It's here, it's, here's the stuff they did for Britain. Here's the stuff in Spain. But also, did you know they worked in Germany, Scandinavia? You can see the stuff in Australia and all these sorts of... Mm. And it's not just comics it's some um, illustration as well 
which I'm, you know, an enormous fan of. So my feeling is, if it's great art, and I like it, hopefully other people will as well. What else have you written about besides the Warren artists? Uh, or published books about, I should say. Um, I've done uh, lots of books about war art, because... Um, I'm a big, big fan of British war comics, which typically were drawn by Italian and Spanish artists. So I've done a couple of collections of those, uh, particularly the covers. Um, I worked with Ryan Hughes on a couple of books called Lifestyle Illustrations of the 50s and 60s, which were women's magazine illustrations, but which were by... American and British artists, so we're talking about people like Kobe Whitmore, Bernie Fuchs, Al Parker, and, uh, you know, notable British artists like Walter Wiles, Harry Hans, and all these sorts of people. Now, that was totally unknown territory. Ryan had it had access to IPC's archives, as as I had over the years, I've done a lot of work with IPC's um, archives. Uh, and he went in with a group of people and started photographing bound copies of women's magazines of the 50s and 60s, came back with this astonishing artwork and uh, asked me if I would write the text for it. And we went through the books together trying to identify the artists as well. Uh, again, this was a case of just being blown away by the artwork, feeling the need to let other people know about it as well. Uh, I've worked with George Curry on a couple of projects. Um, yeah, I noticed you and he are good friends. On yeah, Facebook. absolutely. Sure. Yeah, uh, John John B. Cook as well, because I worked with John on um, uh, Comic Book Artist magazine, writing for that for ages. And that just came from me writing a fan letter to him when I bought the first issue. I said, this has got everything I like in a magazine. So he said, write for me. So I did. Uh, we did the Warren Companion together, of course. Um, I worked with George on True Brit. And I've been um, cheerleading on his various other projects over the years. Uh, probably the least known book I did was something called... Um, uh, the superhero book, which uh, came out of a publisher in America, which I don't think anybody's seen. It was just like a encyclopedia of superheroes. I think I might have seen it. Are you so? <laughs> but I think I saw it maybe in a used bookstore or something. So I don't know what's inside it, but I feel like that rings a bell. That was a less happy collaboration. Though. The editor and I didn't necessarily see things. It was a tie-in with the early. Um, superhero films, films that were coming yeah. out and we knocked heads over some of the inclusions the one that sticks in my mind was Hellboy you know? and she was saying well that's a horror character it's not a superhero and I was making the point well there's going to be a Hellboy film I don't think it had come out at that point there's going to be a Hellboy film this is a popular character I can assure you people will want to read about Hellboy um I don't think Hellboy ended up mm. being, I'm sure he didn't. Uh, so, uh, But there were other contributors to it. If you look at it, the editor's name is in very, very big letters on the cover. My mm -hmm. name is in very, very small letters, mm -hmm. despite her not actually writing a single word gotcha. of it. But uh, the editor has the power in these things. Right. Um... But I've done a lot of books about Vampirella. Yes, as well. that's the one by you that I own with the really nice reproductions of covers and so on. And then I bought a couple of those Dynamite volumes based on your influence, I would say, um, which kind of leads me to a question that I've asked you before online, but um, which is that you really seem to love that kind of art. Yes, in, in Vampirella, which I would say is kind of like the key distinction between um, the American style and the British style. The British is more realistic and it's more static. It's more about 
as you would say in the UK, good drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, the American is more about the movement. It's more about creating what Scott McCloud calls the comic iconic style mm. of the particular artist, which is communicating through uh, a kind of particular style and line and cartooniness. And um, I think when I asked you online, you just said, well, I just like, you know, what I like, which is that more kind of British European style. I love Jack Kirby as well. Yes, Jack <laughs> Kirby is a really good example. But, you know, you've got Ditko and you've got... But even, I think, when I see you post about the American artists you love, which are Russ Heath or Ross Andrew or Garcia Lopez and so on, they've got some of that dynamism and movement that you have to have to mm. work for American yeah. comics, especially Marvel. But they're still very 70s, realistic... And so that is just what I'm attracted to. That's why when I saw the yes. Joe Matt thing in your thing, I was like, holy crap, I never thought you'd like Joe Matt. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got an enormous collection of underground comics as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what can I say? I just love the comics medium and I'm always curious to see what's out there. But, but what would you say to people like myself who might, you know, say, well, comics is more built towards movement and panel to panel transitions and well i mean i don't you see growing up in britain yeah. our comics were always very different because they were anthology titles for yes. the most part yes so typically a story you know when i was reading tv action the stories were usually two or three pages long even in 2000 ad the episodes were only six pages long usually it's a totally different way of approaching the page. We construct them often around one central image or one panel that's the powerful yeah, panel. Right. It's less about um, panel to panel continuity. Yeah, it's yeah. more about making an impact in, in that sense. Uh, obviously, the war comics are different because they're 64 pages long. But even then, it's only two panels a page. It's, it's sort of different. Uh, I'm always attracted to the more illustrative style of art, I suppose. You know, I mean, I loved Bernie Wrightson, Jeff Jones, Mike Kaluta, these sorts of people. Um, the Warren artists just totally resonated with me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first saw Vampirella, I thought, this is the best drawing I have ever seen. You mm. know, Jose Gonzalez, mm -hmm. Pepe Gonzalez, I should say, as he's called in Spain, just blew me away. And then when I discovered Louis Garcia, in, who was also drawing in Vampirella, it was another level of realism on top of that. Well, like I told you, I think your flesh tones are very inspired by Gonzalez. To me, they seem oh. very similar. Yeah, I mean... He's an absolute idol of mine. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, Louis as well. Louis's a friend of mine, and he's been enormously helpful in giving me tips on on drawing. He's he's the master, absolute master. I mean, he was drawing comics when he was fifteen, and they were great even then. Um, his his pencils are ultra realistic, and. Um, so when I'm doing my Vampirella commissions or my life drawing, it's, I mean, I know how long it takes him to do those. And it's a level of realism that is possibly too much for what I need. So I'm, I suppose in that sense, I'm more influenced by, by Pepe's drawing. Everybody that knew him uh, called him a genius. And I interviewed lots of people for my book. Uh, everybody said he was a genius and I, I totally believe it he was one of these people that could just draw anything he could see and in fact he could even draw from from memory oh, oh he's called, talking about Gonzalez Gonzalez yeah. yeah yeah I mean you could say the same about Louis believe me but uh, yeah about Gonzalez his drawings of Vampirella are just mm. extraordinary mm -hmm. they um, are they are you know, it's just... They're the epitome of that style. Yeah. I'm not knocking it. I just 
it's just so different to me than the, the other Yeah, thing. I mean, it just, it, it's everything that I like, mm. I suppose. Uh, and then I've had the opportunity to draw some covers of Vampirella and commissions. And I just, you know, over half of all the commissions I'm asked to draw are pictures of Vampirella. So I've just drawn her a lot. Are you doing more commissions than page work these days? No, not at all. Not at all. Because you hardly post your pages where you tend to post your commissions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I've just... This year, I've drawn four more episodes of Judge Anderson, mm. but I can't, I can't post them because they're not in print yet. I see. Uh, and I've just done so much Doctor Who as well. I tend to, I post the covers that I do, the Doctor Who covers. But uh, no, I mean I'm inking vast amounts of stuff for Doctor Who every every month. Pretty much every month I'm in the comic to some degree. If I'm, I'm either drawing it or inking it. Isn't an anthology comic? Doctor Who magazine is just, it's a magazine about Doctor Who. We're the only strip in it. I see. So it's got stories and yeah. articles. And, yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, 12 pages a month. Mm. And so I'm doing things around that. The last couple of years, I've just been the busiest I've ever been. And I've just had a such a backlog of commissions so i mean i've posted a lot this week but some of them for people who've been asking waiting for ages and i've got every time i post them it creates more interest how much do you charge for one of those really glorious commissions with the really you know detailed muscles and the shading oh, like the betty Page Vampire, Vampirella. Sure. Yeah, that's... the recent and Anderson and the Judge Das. Yeah, about two hundred pounds. Um, they're a steal. I mean, those cover if they were comic covers by some American artist, they would go for two thousand. Know? Yeah, I mean, I will put this out here for public consumption. If anybody wants to pay me two thousand pounds for a commission, <laughs> I am more than happy to do that. And it'll be worth it. <laughs> I don't know what the right price is, quite honestly. Well, I've gone to conventions and I'm like, oh, Joe Quesada, I remember him. Let me flip through his book. And he's got covers. And, and they're sometimes, like, they're striking, but they're not, they don't have the kind of the filigree and the depth of work that people like you have. And, but because it's a cover and it's, mm. it's you know, it's a few thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, I do charge more for published covers, mm. um, that sort of thing. Um, I guess the last question I'll ask you is, say, in the next 10 years, is there are there any particular things you'd really like to do, like whether they're realistic or not, uh, in terms of attainability, in terms of writing or comics work? Uh, I can't say too much about it yet. I'm not quite sure why, but um, yeah, I'm going to be doing some stuff for the European market. I've become very friendly with a excellent writer in Germany, Peter Meningen, and uh, we're going to be doing something together. Uh, I would. I've got in uh, Berlin. Um, this would be yeah. Well, this yeah. This oh, would, I was just there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah, this would be for stuff that would be sold across Europe. So it's very exciting. Mm. He's an excellent writer. I I expect I will be doing more Doctor Who because it is just totally dominating my life. But what would you like to do if you could do anything? Publish uh, any book, work on any comic, what, what would you... I, well, in comics, I would like to do my own graphic novel, I suppose. Something, that you write and yes, that you can see? Yes, absolutely. Would, so, it, would it be more of a genre thing, like an adventure thing, or would it be more... Historical. Historical. Historical with... Elements of the supernatural, I suppose. You know. What period in history is your favorite? Ah, Elizabethan. Ah, lovely. Mm. That would be that would be my deal. Uh, in the style of my finished uh, life drawings, that's what I would love to do. But Kind know, of like a Jim Silk kind of thing, maybe. 
Yeah, well, I mean, more... Not, not like his stuff, but like I feel like every one of his yeah, play, well, pals is like that kind of... If I could do something that's as good as Louis Garcia's work mm-hmm. in Vampirella or Pepe Gonzalez, mm-hmm. that's what I'm aiming at. Mm. They're my heroes. That would be the sort of thing that that would mean so much to me to, to reach that level. Whether it's possible or not, I just don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I would love that. But I really, really want to do more drawings. Um, just a question I forgot to ask you. Have you gotten a lot of feedback about your books? Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. So you have reached people who... Yeah, Yeah. the last... Not, not so much the Vampirella, the Art of Vampirella book, because mm. that wasn't... You know, I mean, it's... It was a popular book, but it, I, I wasn't able to put as much into that because it was just the covers. That's right. Uh, but the last two, the, the Pepe Gonzalez book and the Spanish book, I've had loads of feedback. Mm. Absolutely loads. People have loved them because there's been all these fans that grew up reading these things and just knew nothing about the artists. And what I've been determined to do with the book is have... Okay, you think you know them. I'm going to show you vast amounts you didn't know was out there at all. Mm. And it's even better than the stuff you knew. Mm. Mm. Uh, So, yeah, they've been really well received. Wonderful. The only criticism I've had about the Spanish book is that everybody wanted it to be longer. Mm. It's almost 300 pages as it is. Well, you might be able to do another volume in a few years or something if the demand I've had, is there. Yeah, people said, why couldn't it be 500 pages long? I mean, mm. I could say you couldn't pick it up. That's right. But I've had requests for people saying, can you do one on Italian artists or Filipino artists or British artists? Good, I'm glad. Um, and do you want to talk about your show in Poland at all? Or? Yeah, yeah. That's something... Uh, a couple of years back, my friend uh, Bartosz and I put on a Judge Dredd exhibition over here. And uh, the Polish, the big Polish comics festival asked if they could show it the next year um, at their their convention. Unfortunately, we, we'd borrowed, I mean, half the stuff there was from my collection, but we borrowed a lot of art and had to send it back, obviously. So that wasn't really possible. But then we said, well, maybe we could do an, an exhibition for you of British comic art, because so much of it just isn't known outside of Britain. And is, this is, you know, a big, big convention over there. And I thought this is the perfect opportunity to have an exhibition of the whole breadth of, of British comic art. So we go back to... Frank Bellamy, Ron Embleton, Frank Hampson, these sorts of people, and Jim Holdaway, Modesty Blaze pages, through 2000 AD. We were looking earlier on at a page that Rufus Stayglow has uh, has lent for the exhibition of uh, Dave Gibbons' Rogue Trooper. Wow, I mean... That was a gorgeous page. That is just out of this world, isn't Stunning, it? Stunning, yeah. And then we go through... 2080 years to to now. I was just thinking about what you said earlier about British pages focusing on one panel that the, mm. and that panel with the head in the Gibbons page yeah. was the yeah and I, that was what I was drawn to and now I see that yeah yeah it's all about making an impact on the page that's right and having a focus on one panel that's yeah. very interesting and it sort of anchors the other absolutely as supposed to yeah and we've got each generation that comes up seems to produce more amazing artists so as we were looking at sean phillips well he's my generation really but I've, we've got sean phillips and duncan of grado who came into comics when i did who are both amazing but then we've also got ben oliver who is just an uh, astonishing draftsman who yeah. should be better known than he is but he's just the stuff you posted by him is really nice. Oh, yeah, it yeah. just knocks me out. And Charlie Adlard, who's now a massive star in America, of course. He's become really big. Yeah. And he's now yeah. your comics laureate. He is. He is our comics laureate, he taking over, over from Dave Gibbons, yeah. who was the first comics laureate. Yeah. Yeah, my impression is that it's lots of work and you don't really get paid for it, so they're welcome to it. No, it's sort of more like a uh, you got to go around and tout comics to kids and you know literacy and 
that kind of thing. I did a talk last year, actually, at House of Illustration in London about girls' comics, which is another area that I'm yeah. um, a big fan of. And that was fascinating because uh, I was there with a couple of um, other speakers who were coming at it from the academic background. I thought there'd be about two people in the audience. I always feel if there's more people in the audience than on stage, <laughs> then it's a success. <laughs> Amazingly, the room was was packed. I'd go to that. Not, yeah, I can see that. Again, it was just fascinating to see that people were interested in all this history that's not yeah. really been talked about before. That's right. You know, we've got, there's a big comic over here called Misty, which was, you know, a horror comic for girls um, and that's sort of the hook that brings people in because it's still quite popular now but uh, oh there were so many British girls comics there were people in the audience saying well I read this when I like Diana we were talking yeah about. we were talking about that yeah there were so many different areas and it was um, yeah the interest is out there it's just bringing it together presenting it in a way that people find accessible well, we'll stop there, unless there's anything else you want to say. Um, I will see you all at conventions around the world. <laughs> yeah, check out his Facebook page. It really is a fantastic treat. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. David Roach is on Twitter at David A. Roach. Tell us what you think. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com, Twitter at Decon Comics, like our Facebook page or join our Facebook discussion group. All our social media links can be found on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com, and we can be found on YouTube on the Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcasts.com and on comiccon.com, where our new episodes appear a few days before they show up anywhere else. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio, especially on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes. We only have 11 reviews there. Can we get it to 20 reviews by September 18th? More review activity on Apple Podcasts would really help the show, so please go there right now, unless you're driving, and write a few nice words about us. Our theme is from bensound.com. On the latest episode of To the Bat Poles, Paul and I discuss how the introduction of Batgirl became the prescription for attempting to rescue the Batman TV series, and we'll talk about her first appearance on the show 50 years ago. Also, an interview with Molly Marcus, reference archivist at the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming, where I went last month to scan Batman scripts. Which scripts did I get? Look up To The Bat Poles wherever you find your podcasts or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. We're on a bit of a hiatus right now, but we expect to be back on September 28th. This coming Thursday, yet another extra episode of Deconstructing Comics, as Coombe moves on to London and talks with Paul Gravett, a comics historian, journalist, and exhibition curator. He's currently working on a touring show on Asian comics that will start in Rome next month. He'll talk about that and much more this coming Thursday. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.